in early April, I was one of the lucky few to experience a very quick test ride of Zero Motorcycle's new flagship electric motorbike, the 2020 SRF, when Zero UK's country manager Dale Robinson brought along a press bike to my local Zero dealer, Street Bike in Helso in near Birmingham. On the strength of that short ride and seeing the bike up close and personal, I decided to put my money where my mouth is and put down a deposit. On the 18th of July, while my Zero DSR was in for its 12,000 mile service, I took the SRF for a ride from Street Bike to Ludlow in Shropshire, a favourite destination of mine, to put it through its paces on a longer test ride. Now before I carry on, just to prevent a slew of specification questions, I'll talk about the main most frequently asked specifications during the course of this video, but I'll also display them and provide a link in the description to the specifications on Zero's website. The SRF is Zero's latest offering, a Street Fighter style motorbike with a redesigned ZF7510 motor and ZF14.4 lithium ion battery in a wider frame and heavier format than its predecessors. But trust me, even though it has gained weight, like the best of us, it is no slouch. Delivering 190 newton meters of torque and 110 horsepower, or 82 kilowatts, it's Zero's most powerful motorbike to market to date. The ZF14.4 battery sits inside a newly designed aluminium heatsink housing, which, together with a thermal transfer interface, provides battery cooling. Meanwhile, the ZF7510 motor, also passively air-cooled to reduce motor heat, is again an AC brushless motor and is capable of pushing the bike to a factory limited top speed of 200 km per hour or 120 miles per hour. Claimed range is 259 km or 161 miles in the city, 159 km at 89 km per hour or that's 99 miles at 55 miles per hour and 132 km at 113 km per hour which is 82 miles at 70 miles per hour. To use the EU standard measure, that's EU Regulation 134 Stroke 2014 Annex 7, range is 157 kilometres, or in old money, 97 miles. Zero, taking the Henry Ford approach to easy decision making for customers, offers the SRF in a veritable spectrum of colours. Alright, two of them. Seabright blue or boardwalk red. In case any of you outside the US, and particularly outside California, wondered about the provenance of Seabright Blue and Boardwalk Red, well, Zero was started by surfing fanatics, and Seabright Beach is under 10 miles from Zero's HQ in Scotts Valley, California. And I may be going out on a limb here, but presumably the boardwalk there is or was painted red. Zero sold previous models with the flawed Greenwatt Power or Calyx built-in chargers, which provided 1.3 kilowatts of onboard charging power, a factor limited by the US's 120 volt main system. A separate onboard mains powered charger for the European market with a 13 amp fuse could have provided a theoretical 3 kilowatts of power, given Europe's standard 230 volt supply, but Zero never offered that option to customers in Europe. In any case, the company has now included fast charging via a Type 2 socket in Europe and a J1772 socket in the US, and removed the IEC C13 plug and C14 socket, or what most of us would call a PC socket. Now there's no doubt about it, this is a step in the right direction at least, and means that Zero joins the rest of the mainstream EV community in using either J1772, that's Type 1, or IEC 62196 Menekes, that's type 2, as the base charging interface. The only issue is that these come as standard in other EVs. On the Zero range, they're either an expensive option on the earlier bikes, or they've pushed up the price on the SRF. The SRF comes with built-in charging at 3 kilowatts on the standard model and 6 kilowatts on the premium model. An additional power tank will become available, although it is not yet available, which will enable the charging to be increased further to 9 kilowatts and even 12 kilowatts. With the highest charging ability, the bike can therefore be charged in around an hour. But for an already expensive bike, the idea of paying another two and a half thousand pounds for an additional six kilowatts of speed will seem scandalous to many electric car owners. 
Remember, on electric cars with rapid charging, you're looking at speeds of above 43 kilowatts on AC or 50 kilowatts DC as standard, not at extra cost. The change in charging interface means that charging the SRF in Europe requires either a dedicated Type 2 lead terminated with a Type 2 connection on both ends, or a granny lead which connects to a domestic socket on one end and a Type 2 plug on the other. In the UK, fast chargers can be typically found at supermarkets, attractions, leisure complexes, hotels, train stations and in car parks. But most electric car owners with off-road parking will more commonly have one installed at home, with support from an OLEV, that's the Office for Low Emission Vehicles, grant. Or at work, for which there are also government incentives. The alternative to a dedicated fast charge point is to use the previously mentioned granny cable, which comprises a lead from a domestic plug on one end to a Type 2 plug on the other, with a box of tricks in the middle. Whilst the zero lead for this is very clever, at around £400 it is not very cheap. The cockpit display on the SRF does away with the LCD screen of the older bike range and is now a 7 inch full colour display with navigable menus and preferences accessible from the handlebar mode switch. Sat behind this is the bike's new Cypher 3 operating system. I didn't get a chance to pair my Zero phone app with the bike to explore any additional options available from within the app, but from what I can gather in the user manual, a variety of customization can be made in terms of what's displayed in the four corners of the screen, in addition to the usual configuration options. As with other more recent Zero models, updates and fixes to the bike's firmware can be made over the air. From what I have read, this appears to be done using a cellular connection to the bike rather than Bluetooth now. The cellular connection on the bike means that the motorcycle can be tracked and monitored remotely, and this remote monitoring can be achieved without the necessity to be in close proximity to the bike, as is the case with Bluetooth. A welcome addition is the ability to set a charging schedule, so that the bike can simply be plugged in at home and the charging will commence when set by the schedule. Many electric cars offer this feature, and it's good to see Zero have adopted it now that charging is achieved through a Type 2 socket. The schedule is set up only through the app and cannot be configured on the bike itself other than to turn the feature on and off. Another welcome addition is the option to set charge target, a maximum charge level on the battery, so that the battery can now be set to charge to 80% rather than a full 100%. This should have a longer term beneficial effect to the longevity of the battery. Zero themselves revised their initial advice on this a couple of years ago, having initially advised owners to just charge to 100% and not to worry about it. The reality is that 100% charging doesn't harm a battery if the bike is used, but leaving the bike sat at 100% charge for a number of days appears to have a detrimental effect on battery longevity. Similarly, leaving it too low for a longer period is also considered detrimental. Remember, we're not dealing with laptop or mobile phone batteries here, this is a different chemistry. But, to prolong the life of the bike's battery, a standard charge to around 70-80%, to 80 where this is all that is required, appears to be the way to go. Then, if required, just before riding, a top up to 100% can be made. One thing I did observe while I was riding was that while the charge indicator, indicating the battery charge level, decreased throughout the ride, as expected, the torque meter, which indicates acceleration and regenerative braking, didn't appear to move at all throughout the ride. A small early bug perhaps? Or maybe it was rider error. In any event, I expected some kind of measure of my power output to be indicated somewhere on screen. But what appeared to be the power gauge appeared fully lit at all times. The bike has four predefined riding modes, Eco, Street, Sport and Rain, and an additional custom mode. Each riding mode can have different custom traction settings set. Street, Sport, Rain or indeed Off. Traction control is new in the Zero range on the SRF. The riding mode is selected using the mode button on the left handlebar which is positioned just above the indicator switch. Now initially I found this a little odd but I did become accustomed to it by the end of the ride. Mode changes are only applied when the throttle is shut off fully. It is possible to apply a mode change whilst throttling, but it doesn't apply until the throttle is fully closed. As for how the modes affect the riding, 
Eco mode reduces acceleration, brings the top speed down to 75 miles per hour and has strong regenerative braking. Street mode maintains a comfortable middle ground between Eco and Sport in acceleration and regenerative braking. Sport mode allows significantly faster acceleration than in other modes and the regen is wound up a bit compared to Eco but felt roughly the same as street mode to me. Rain mode reduces acceleration, sets the top speed to 100 miles per hour, that's 160 kilometers per hour, and winds regenerative braking right down. Finally, custom mode, like with previous models, can be configured using the Zero app on an Android or iOS device, and then sent to the bike via Bluetooth. I didn't get a chance to play with this, but according to the manual, the custom ride mode can be custom named and assigned a colour for easy identification on the colour display. Another new feature on the SRF is cruise control. The cruise control button is situated below the motor stop switch on the right handlebar, where the starter switch lives on a petrol bike. The bike has a fairly simple implementation of cruise control. Ride at the speed you want to cruise and then long press the cruise control button followed by a second quick press on the same button. Once set, braking or accelerating kicks the bike out of cruise mode, as does another short press on the cruise control button. There is no means, however, to incrementally increase or decrease the set cruise speed. The headlight switch has been given a much better design on the SRF. Gone is the horrible sliding switch from the top of the bar, a personal bugbear of mine and switching between main and full beam is now achieved by flicking a switch forward with the tip of your left hand's index finger. Back to main beam by pulling back on the same switch and past to flash in the customary way with a pull back on the switch. This is a much better means of controlling the main headlight than the switch on the older models. In terms of range, I rode a total of 82.4 miles starting out with 91% battery capacity and arriving back with 11% riding at proper road speed limits and up to speed limit where appropriate. In other words, I didn't ride the bike any differently from how I would ride a petrol bike. I therefore make that around a mile per percentage at standard road speeds, so that I would arrive at a personal estimated range of around 100 miles or 160 kilometers per charge of normal riding. This is slightly better than my Zero DSR, but not much. And remember that the SRF contains a 14.4 kilowatt hour battery rather than the 13 kilowatt hour battery on my DSR. Clearly the weight of the bike is coming into play a bit here. The side stand seems to be weaker than the one on my DSR. It's also set slightly further back, which I found required me to position my foot further back to push the side stand down. Furthermore, I came close to dropping the bike at one point when I got off the bike on a slight incline and had not quite got the side stand fully down. The bike rolled forward and started to tip. That could have been a very bad moment. <laughs> this is a wider problem with the zero range. On geared bikes, a rider will leave their bike in gear once they've stopped the bike in order to stop it rolling. This can't be done on a zero, of course. I did once buy a simple front brake lever locking mechanism, which acted in a similar way, but found it surplus to requirements. In reality, I haven't found this to be a problem with my zero DSR, but it nearly caused me a lot of embarrassment with the SRF. There are improvements to the tank storage area with a larger flip top lid accessed by inserting the bike's key into a lock release on the left side of the bike. The storage area is quite spacious and it's quite nice to see a couple of USB charge points in there. Just below this space on the tank area is the lid giving access to the bike's charge port. I'm not especially keen on the design of this as the small lid looks prone to damage but aesthetically it does at least follow the line of the tank, so it makes sense in that respect. Should the user decide to install an additional 3kW or 6kW charging via a charge tank, as previously the storage area is used, but in the case of the SRF my understanding is that a small amount of storage space is still available. So if you're minded to spend an additional approximately £2,500 to add a further 6kW, you can do so, and the bike is still charged from the original Type 2 socket. Naturally, with 12 kilowatts charging, time to charge is reduced once again quite severely. But the reality is, you'll need to find one of the reasonably rare 22 kilowatt fast charge points in the UK, or more likely risk incurring the wrath of Renault Zoe owners by using AC connections at rapid charge points. 
and you won't benefit from 12 kilowatt fast charging in the typical UK household, where the standard single phase supply can cope with up to around 7 kilowatts through a 32 amp fast charger. And just because I know this is useful information for someone out there, I wanted to know for myself, I can confirm that you can fit USB leads through the closed lid of the storage area, which means you can easily run power to a handlebar mounted phone or camera if required. The seal around the lid is provided by rubber piping, so the lead passes comfortably through without breaking the seal. My conclusions then. The SRF is a quality bike. It's well constructed and holds the road beautifully. Yes, it's relatively heavy at 220 or 226 kilograms for the standard and premium models respectively, but its weight really doesn't affect the handling in a negative way. Indeed, slow riding the SRF with its thicker tyres and low down weight is a breeze. Zero has done a great job of putting together an eye-catching piece of engineering. And the number of people who approached me when I stopped in Ludlow and asked me about the bike was far greater than the number of people who would usually question me about the DSR. There's clearly something universally attractive about the SRF. Whether it's the new fins around the battery and motor, the intricate design around the frame, or just the colours, it was definitely turning some heads, even when not running. It's also clearly selling well. I'm led to believe that Zero's entire manufacturing output is currently given over to getting SRFs out of the door to meet demand, and that they have even expanded the production line. Orders for other bikes in their range are being put back. Following my very quick test ride of the SRF back in April, I decided that I was probably going to buy one. However, in the intervening weeks, reality has bitten. A decision on the finance agreement on my bike was approaching, and I had to decide whether to pay off the outstanding balance of the bike and keep it, swap it in as a deposit on an SRF, or sell it and walk away. My DSR was valued at around £9,000 private sale. I thought this would take a nice chunk off the balance of the SRF, but would still leave me around £10,000 short without factoring in all the extras I'd need, such as a rack and top box, and even the granny cable, a princely £400. The official luggage for the SRF is made by Shad, rather than Jivy or Kappa, and the Shad luggage system is not compatible with the Jivy monarchy system, so this in itself would prove to be an expensive extra and see me unnecessarily doubling up on top boxes and panniers. Besides, the SRF is a street fighter, it has a more racing style seating position and frankly luggage would spoil its lines. But I need luggage, certainly a top box at least. The SRF is a great bike for commuters and day riders, but it's not as suited to touring as the DSR. Like the other emerging electric motorbike manufacturers, Energica, Lightning and Harley Davidson, Zero quite understandably want to launch a looker on their new platform. And they've certainly achieved that. I anticipate that they will follow through though with a DSR equivalent on the same platform. A DSRF, if you like. But what many of us existing Zero owners and potential new owners would like is for Zero to progress to true rapid charging. It's what we'd hoped for and anticipated when the SRF was announced and in the background of other manufacturers following the DC charging route. Almost exclusively CCS. But we were disappointed. Yes, the level 2 charging is a huge improvement, but over the last few weeks one of the decisions I came to was that the next new electric motorbike I buy must have level 3 charging. Until then, I'm sticking with the DSR. So, I paid off the balance remaining on the finance and decided to keep it. Domestic finances enter into the equation of course, but even leaving aside the high price of the Zero SRF, I realised that in the cold light of day, it was not really that much better a bike than my DSR. Certainly not that much money better than my DSR. The DSR suits me perfectly. I have it set up how I like it. The only thing mine hasn't been able to do to my complete satisfaction is charge far more quickly than the standard nine hours. So, having resolved to keep the DSR, I decided to do something to improve the charging situation. But that, my friends, is for another video. Thanks for watching as always and see you next time. <laughs>